our tent has arrived, and uh, we'll be putting it up not this week, but the week after. Uh, I checked with codes because one of the fire people came by this week and told us all the things we needed to fix for the fire issues, but I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, she said, uh, you know, it's 20 by 40, I'm not sure about that, but you might check with the, with the about a permit, she said, you're probably going to need a couple of illuminated exit signs. <laughs> She's just doing her job. But anyway, I called and got a hold of someone, and they said a, super, a supervisor couldn't reach them, and uh, they left a message. So anyway, I looked online. It's pretty simple. 20 by 40 uh, is, is 800 square feet. Anything over 900 square feet, the city says you have to have a permit for. Anything under that, you don't. So we're safe. Right? That was, yeah, that took another few hours of my day. Thank you. <laughs> you can see I'm in a good mood this morning, right? It's a good mood all around Praise God. What a beautiful day, huh? What a gorgeous day. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We're moving into the Christmas season. And so I went ahead and chose some, some Christmassy songs for us this morning. And I just want you to sing along. You should have the words there in front of you. Let's do that. God wished he made it and nothing he would spend. Remember the price of saving the born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Come 
and was always sacrificed each year for the forgiveness of the sins of Israel. God said, no, once and for all, I'm going to have to send the most perfect, the most spotless, my son Jesus. And he'll suffer and die, and his blood will be shed for forgiveness of sin. Not just for one year, but every year from here on out for eternity. One time and done. So Jesus said, this is my blood, which is to be shed for you in forgiveness of sin. When you drink, remember Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity again just to come together and celebrate not only your birth, but God, your death, for what it means to us, what you've done for us. God, I pray that you would move in a deep way this year at Christmas in our hearts. We invite you into our destruction, Lord. Change us in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we could call this the religious left. <laughs> and this is the religious right. That's because we're right. That's right. So you guys are the left. Sort of. <laughs> See, I like to divide my congregation. It's what I do. <laughs> what? Too much big gold. <laughs> Tell you, my computer is, is not wanting to, to do much today, so I don't know why, but it's not. And that's okay. I want to remind you that next Sunday, after our uh, service, we will be having the society meeting where we elect new officers uh, for the board and uh, and uh, and new uh, nom uh, a couple of people I think on the nominating committee. So if you're a member, I would encourage you to stick around and uh, vote, let your voice be heard, so to speak, and. Uh, and like I said, I'm planning on not, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after having the service in the tent down there. And I hope that it, and pray that it'll, it'll work well for us. We'll see. I'm planning on putting it right over here in the corner. And that was okay with the contractor. And the uh, engineer was here this week regarding the building. And uh, the contractor came along with another guy. They're gonna be co-superintending this job and trying to get things done, as well as they're gonna to try to get this middle wall shored up as quickly as they can for us or torn down because it is moving. So um, there's some movement, there's some things, good things going on. The struggle is, is, is with the insurance. So, you know, and that's a, that's a battle that's kind of out of my hands right now. Um, but when they reach that final point, which God knows when that's gonna be, because right now we're looking at having to go with an appraiser. We've asked for that because they have not accepted our public adjuster bid. So we're gonna go with an appraiser and those two appraisers, ours and theirs, will fight it out and then they'll meet somewhere, hopefully, and if they don't, then there'll be an umpire appointed and that umpire will say strike or foul, so to speak, and he'll decide what the final amount will be or she, she whoever that is. I hope it doesn't go that far, but because if it does, that just means more time. And just dragging it out and dragging it out. And if that's if that's the case, then you know the Lord fights our battles, doesn't he? You know, it's out it's out of my hands, out of your hands. But we can't pray that God would would uh, soften the hearts of men and women and uh, help us to get this place built back for Him. And the Grinch said. Well, let me let me get let me let me. I got my my priorities messed up here. Let me pray for the word of God first before we go to the Grinch's word. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, we hold your word in our hands. It is true. It is active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. Guide it rightly divides between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It properly discerns the thoughts of the mind, the intents and purposes of the heart. God, I pray that you would come off these pages and jump right into our hearts. Change us for eternity, for your glory. God, we are a simple people. We love you. We gather here on this place, on this porch, because we love you and because we can. We pray, God, that you would not only multiply us in our hearts and minds and rid us of our devastation, but also that you would multiply the congregation. Your word tells us you add to the congregation daily. That's your job. And we trust you with that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. And the Grinch said, <laughs> the Grinch said, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? Have y'all ever seen the Grinch? Yeah. And it came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought of before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What 
if Christmas perhaps is a little bit more. Somehow the Grinch thought that if he stole Christmas, we know this story, the people of Whoville would miss Christmas. But the people of Whoville realized that Christmas wasn't about the presents and decorations and definitely not about the roast beast. <laughs> well, the calendar, as we know, says that Christmas will be here soon. And it will. And so before we move further into the Christmas season, I want to I want to prod as I love to do and pose questions, a question for sure. Answer that question and then give some practical application for you this morning. And so I've titled my sermon, my message this morning, Will Christmas Come? Will Christmas Come? That naturally prompts the question, do I mean that it is possible for Christmas not to come? Yes, it is possible for Christmas not to come. When all the activities of the season, too often and far too many, when the Christmas is over, we're not any different than we were before. Because, you see, when Christmas really comes, and this is what I'm getting at, it changes us. It makes us difference. It makes a difference in our life each Christmas. It's, it isn't just a day we observe and then move on. Well, I'm glad that's over. Woo, that was a rough one. That was a long one. Now i got to get rid of the, uh, what is that, the, uh, oh, that's been traveled through the family for centuries, it seems like, the uh, fruit cake. Right? And you, it's your turn, you get it in the box, it's got goop dripping out of the corner, right? And then you got to get rid of all those ugly ties and stuff. People sent you from up north with sweaters. Is it just another day, St. Patrick's Day, or even Thanksgiving Day? So every year, for millions of people, Christmas really never comes. And I'm not saying that December 25th okay, doesn't come. It comes. But Christmas doesn't really come into their hearts, see, and their lives. So my prayer is that somehow this Christmas, God's Spirit will come upon us and change us, and maybe even grow our hearts a couple of sizes, as it did the Grinch, a couple of extra sizes. I know you can probably use that back there, little Mike. You need an extra size on your heart or two? No? You're good. He's laughing. He don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a different generation. Uh, Christmas, will it really happen? With that in mind, I have noted some things I, I, I want to share with you as we celebrate this season together. The first one is this. This Christmas season has come. Christmas decorations have all, you know, all went up a lot of times well before even Thanksgiving. Uh, that Santa Claus started making his appearance at all the malls and newspapers nearly you know, doubled in size with all the ads because of the advertisement they, you know, they, they have in them now. And in fact... It seems that more attention is being given to the, the shopping habits of Americans on the day after Thanksgiving. Have you noticed that? Maybe you haven't. Of course we call it Black Friday. Why? I don't know. I don't know why it's Black Friday. But both, you see it on TV and our newspapers and the malls and our shopping. Media tells us even how much money we spent already. Have you heard that? The nation has spent blah, 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 and expected to spend blah, 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 blah this year. That's just not right to me. Who cares? I don't care. Spend, spend, spend. And so during this season, we're encouraged to buy things we can't afford with money we don't have, typically, to give to people we're not even sure we like. <laughs> right? i got to give so-and-so something. Well, I know I haven't talked to him in 14 years, but it is Christmas. So we get him some, oh, there's a nice blender. 85-year-old man don't need a blender. The, com the commercial side of Christmas, I will say, has arrived. The social side of Christmas has begun. I'm sure y'all have gone to some of your little fruit fruit Christmas parties. You know, we all do. Dressing up in those... In your fancy fancies or in your ugliest Christmas sweater. That's always a good one. 
and enjoying ourselves at parties and hanging out with friends and family, and that's always good. But as the day approaches, many people will travel, and they're going to find a way to get over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house and hope she didn't get run over by a reindeer. Right? There was a man in Salt Lake City who decided to send 600 Christmas cards out. True story. He got telephone directories from several cities. Why he did that, I don't know. He addressed 600 cards to people he'd never met. He put return addresses on the envelopes and then he mailed. And amazingly, he received 117 responses from total strangers. One lady wrote, it was so good to hear from you. Your card arrived the day I got home from the hospital, and I can't tell you what an encouragement it was to hear from an old friend. <laughs> Here's another one that wrote, I have to admit that when we received your card, we couldn't really picture you. We had to think hard for a long time before we remembered. By the way, please give our regards to your father. He is such a wonderful man. But I think this one took the fruit cake. One guy, one guy wrote, it was so good to hear from you all the, after all these years. By the way, we're going to be in Salt Lake City next summer. Would it be all right if we came by and spent a few days with you? <laughs> wow. So you need to be careful who you send Christmas cards to, right? The Christmas season, you may get Cousin Eddie on your front door someday. <laughs> the Christmas season has arrived in, in, in the church too, by the way. We, we see the beautiful decorations. <laughs> Maybe not here so much, but we, we, we lift our voices in song. And, and in our community, we see stockings filled in, in, in baskets prepared. And carolers are singing in special services celebrating the reason for the season. But will Christmas really come? The earth will make its 359th revolution of the year on December 25th. It'll come right on schedule, just like it always has. But will Christmas really come? That's, that's the question, because there are several things that have to happen, folks, before Christmas really does come in our hearts and in our lives. And my scripture text this morning is, of all texts, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Now I realize that verse is not typically considered a Christmas text. It's not in the Gospels, so to speak. It's not out of Luke or one of the other stories in the Gospels. But listen to what Paul says. My children, with whom I again, I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone of voice. For I am at a loss about you. They weren't towing the mark in terms of living uh, with Christ in their hearts. And, and we often talk about being born again when we become a Christian. But I suggest to you that Christmas is also a good time to remind us of our need for Christ to be born again in our lives. Our families, our relationships. Because we can claim to be born again and not have evidence of that. And that's what Paul is praying for. That somehow, in a wonderful way, Christ will be formed inside the hearts and lives of each of them and each of us today. That we will keep that, that newness and that wonder of the new birth within our hearts and minds each day. Every day. We sing about it in our songs. Oh, holy child of man. Right? Cast out our sins and enter in. Be born in us today. And then there's another beautiful song that mentions some of the names of Jesus. His name is Master, Savior, Lion of Judah, Prince of Peace, Shepherd, Fortress, Rock of Salvation, Lamb of God is He, Son of David, King of the Ages, Eternal Life, Holy Lord of Glory. His name is Life. And then also Emmanuel, God with us. Folks, we have adapted fairly well, I'd say, to our environment here, of course. But in the world, we've adapted pretty well to our environment. We, we've learned how to, how to clean the air we breathe, we, we purify the water we drink, and we enrich the food we eat. We've adapted ourselves to technology pretty well. Some of us are still trying to get into the 21st century, but we've done pretty well. We've learned how to program our computers, most of us. 
We've learned how to operate our smartphones, except for Bill. And, and we've learned how to figure out our GPSs. Fair enough. Overall, I think we have adapted pretty well to the modern world, but, and you knew this was coming, there's always a but. We have not learned how to get along with each other. Even though more than 2,000 years have passed since that first Christmas, and even though we're reminded every year of the angel's message, peace on earth, we still haven't learned to live in peace with each other, I don't think. So our greatest need this Christmas is still the same as all the other Christmases. And that is to have Jesus formed in us, to live in us, to show us how to accept and to forgive each other. How to get rid of the tensions that divide us. How to overcome our fear and our prejudice, our sin. And how to walk in the peace and the joy that Christ offers. And we know that Christmas will come. But how will Christmas come? How will it come? When you read the Christmas accounts of Matthew and Luke, and you read about Mary, and you read about Joseph, of course, and they're making their way to Nazareth, to Bethlehem. You read about the crowds and the, the, the people who have come to pay their taxes. Luke takes you right through the whole story of the shepherds and the angels. Uh, Jesus being born and then being wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's a great Christmas account. And then he's placed in the manger. And then he adds something you can easily miss. And I think he adds it because he knows someone will ask, why was he born in a stable? And of course, people often ask that. But then almost as an afterthought, Luke says, because there was what? No room at the inn, dummy. There's no room at the inn, so he's born in a stable. I added that dummy part, by the way. Okay. <laughs> but there it is. And doesn't it bother us maybe a little that Luke doesn't condemn the innkeeper? What a scumball! Turn this pregnant woman out. Well, you know how many people were brought. We have this serene scene of, of them going from door to door. And they're knocking. You know how many people were probably knocking, looking for a place to stay? I mean, this wasn't like, it may have been late at night, but the city is packed. There are people everywhere. They're not off the streets and hunkered down. And Mary and Joseph are the only ones walking the street. There are people everywhere looking. But he doesn't condemn the innkeeper. He doesn't even comment about it. He doesn't say he was bad or he was good. He doesn't say he was right or he was wrong. But forever, this crowded city and this crowded inn, and the innkeeper in particular, that shut out Jesus, stands as a symbol of crowded, cluttered lives that make no room for Jesus. Why did the innkeeper miss that Christmas? And he did, by the way. I think the simple answer is preoccupation. Preoccupied. He was busy. His inn was full because a census was being held in Bethlehem. The city was bulging with people because ancestors, who had, whose ancestors came from there, and since Bethlehem was the city of David, all those who were in the line of David, which were there, which included Mary and Joseph, by the way, the innkeeper wasn't necessarily hostile, and he wasn't unsympathetic. He was just busy. Likely he didn't go, sorry, you loser, get out of here, slam. I mean, he may have been very apologetic, but he had nowhere to put them. And it's not that we're bad people. It's just that we're busy people. And our schedules are so full. Even retired folks. Our schedules are so full. I say our, I'm not retired. but Santa can't make you bad. Satan can't make you bad. Satan can make you busy though. We're off busy doing things for Christmas because we think it's Christmas. I gotta do this. But do we have Christ at the heart of it? If you don't have time for Christ, then your schedule is just too cluttered. It is. And I would go further than to say your priorities are off. We need to allot some quiet time to be still and to acknowledge Him 
that He is God every day. And especially at Christmas, spend time adoring Him. It was a message I preached one Christmas called, Oh, come let us ignore Him. <laughs> oh, come let us ignore Him. And I, and how much ignoring does He get, really? If you think about it. Well, the nation will spend blah, blah, blah dollars this year. It's projected that the nation will spend blah, blah, blah dollars up from last year or down from last year. Then I think something else needs to happen before Christmas really comes, and that is that we must desire Him to come. We've got to desire Him to come in our lives. There, there, there's a part of me that wants Him to come, and I want His blessings. But you know what? I'm not absolutely sure I want to carry that cross all the time. I'm a little busy for that. I want His forgiveness, but I'm not sure I want His judgment against me. I kind of like to do things my own way a little, little every now and then. I want a salvation, but I'm not sure I want to serve. I want a Savior, but I'm not sure I want a Lord to direct everything I do. Yet, as I read the Bible, I'm convinced that the one thing Jesus teaches over and over again is that we must make His kingdom our top priority. And His kingdom is within us. There is a, sh a short parable Jesus tells that teaches us that very thing. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus tells about the pearl merchant. The pearl of great price, so to speak. A merchant who's looked all his life for this perfect pearl. And he's gone from marketplace to marketplace, from city to city. And he's accumulated some wealth in that process, a good amount of wealth. He has a bag of precious pearls and other valuables he's collected. Maybe not the perfect one, but he has a lot of them. And he keeps looking for that perfect one. Finally, one day, there is right before his eyes. And within his reach, this wonderful, fabulous, perfect pearl. So he approaches the merchant. Trying to act, you know, all disinterested, like, yeah, oh, what's this old thing? Hmm, pearl, yeah, kind of gnarly looking, but uh, how much you want for this old thing? And the seller says, it's going to cost you everything. Everything you have. So he tries to bargain. Well, now, I don't know that it's worth that. I mean, come on, i got a lot of pearls here. Why don't you come down to blah, blah, blah? How about this much? Mm, no, everything. Well, how about this much instead? I, I'll, I'll give you three quarters of everything. No. He never comes off his price. He will take everything you have. And finally, all his other precious pearls, all his wealth are placed on the counter, and he walks away with the one wonderful pearl. Now church, I think Christmas will never really be Christmas for as long as we have just a casual desire of entering the kingdom of God and of having a relationship with Jesus Christ and for truly knowing the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. It'll always be another holiday. Yeah, Jesus is in it, but oh my gosh, I'm glad to see Christmas come and go. Are you exhausted after Christmas? <clears throat> Why do we have to fill our schedules up with all kinds of stuff? Why? Celebrate Christmas with our friends and family? Okay. I guess that's fair. Do we celebrate Jesus with our friends and family? Or is it, what did you get? Oh, I'm so glad you got that. Oh, I, look what I got. Oh, and look at this and look at that. And that's always wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Grinch. I love getting gifts. I love giving gifts. I like getting. I like that a little more probably. But, <laughs> but I'm just, I hope you get what I'm saying to you. Where is that focus? Everything you have, everything you are, must focus on this one great gift. This one pearl, this one treasure, the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ, it is the greatest gift. His gift is free, by the way. 
if you accept it by faith, yet once you do, here's what you got to do. You got to keep it. And you got to guard it. And you got to nurture it. I'm not talking about your salvation necessarily, although we can go there sometimes. I won't today. But I'm talking about that relationship. And I'm going to close here this morning. Lastly, if Christmas is really going to be Christmas for us, then I think we must approach Christmas with a feeling of humility. Not of dread, not of obligation to buy something for Bumadeen, who we don't really know or like, but out of gratitude and humility. I grew up on a farm, as most of you know, in southwestern Oklahoma, and I have so many memories of working on the farm um, and caring for the livestock. And sometimes I didn't like it too much, by the way. Especially when it was, you know, four, four, five, ten below, and the wind's blowing as it always does in southwestern Oklahoma, 15, 20 miles an hour. And I would often, because the pipes were frozen down to the barn, I would often have to carry water in my coveralls. And as the water would splash against my coveralls, it would almost instantly freeze. I remember those days, the coldest months of the year, going out in the field and wearing rubber boots and crunching the ice and taking an axe and breaking through the ice and my cowboy boots would step up this this deep and uh, what, you know, manure. Okay. Now when I'm around now, cattle or horses or leather saddles or fresh mown alfalfa, that smell, it transports me instantly. It's like that. Back to my farm. My parents' farm is still there today. And all those, my siblings in those years. And, and often, as we approach Christmas, I think of Bethlehem and that stable and those animals. Listen, as you know, I, I've been involved in a couple of cowboy churches. Right? The one particular cowboy church that I planted in Fort Smith, we planted, Steph and I, started in a stockyard. And you know, cowboys, we love stockyards. We love sitting in them. We just love the smell of them. And yeah, I mean, the smell of urine was so strong sometimes in the stockyard. Even though they just cleaned it. The smell of manure was very strong. But it's, it's home. It, it's, it's natural to us. We don't mind it. Now, there were some people who came who weren't really necessarily cowboys, but loved the Western culture. And that's what we invite in. People who love that Western heritage culture when we do cowboy church. But they would often always say, Oh, the smell is horrible. I, I just... I just don't know that I can sit here and have church and all this. And I just chuckled. I said, yeah, yeah, I understand. Some would stay, some wouldn't. And I just wonder. Here's the shepherds coming in. Baby Jesus. Oh, man, it smells in here. Well, they smell like sheep. But still, here, they're smelling it stinks in here. I don't know if I can have church in here or not. I wonder what Jesus thinks when we all come and have church. And we give him less than what he deserves. I wonder if he says, boy, that stinks in here. Come on. But he loves us anyway. I marvel that, that that stable smelled a whole lot like my barn. And I see Mary and I see Joseph entering that place. It probably wasn't too foreign to them to begin with, really. But here's the kicker. It was very foreign to God as he came down. The womb, the baby inside, wrapped in flesh, came out. And I marvel that God would do that and sacrifice that much even to enter into our world and to breathe our air. Don't you think he'd say, oh, it smells in here. I think I need to be born up on the palace there, up in Herod's palace. That'd be a little better life for me. Hello? See, God was stripping away everything and saying now there is nothing that stands between us. There's no place I won't go for you. There's nothing I won't do for you. 
There's no place for your arrogance or your pride. You can't come in here and worship if you're looking down your nose at someone else. And through the doors of that stables come the cows and the sheep and the livestock and Mary and Joseph and, and the parade and you as we see in our minds. And the shepherds kneel. They kneel amongst all of that junk. They kneel. And we come to this place and we kneel down in all our filth and all our junk and we worship God born in the flesh. Do you smell that? Without anything to brag about, we come humbly before Him and we say, here I am, Lord. Use me. And I think that's what it will take for Christmas to really come. In our hearts, it's going to take some broken hearts this morning and some broken wills for Christ to be born again in us. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, then please realize that there is nothing that stands between you and God except you. God has done everything to make it possible for you and I to be free from sin. God has done everything to make it possible for you to spend eternity with Him. You have to go another, you don't have to go another Christmas without true joy, without peace. Many people today miss Christmas because they don't realize they are sinners. They just don't, they just ignore Christ. They don't show any interest in the Savior because they don't understand their need to be saved. What do I need to be saved from? I haven't done anything. I haven't killed anybody this week. I haven't killed anybody yet, but just let somebody cut you off at the parking lot and you sure think about it. I had a guy say that to me at Mission Barbecue last Sunday or the Sunday before, I guess it was. Yeah. He was like an old, he was driving a big Ford pickup or a Dodge Ram. Of course, he's one of those Dodge people. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had <laughs> find another church. Thank you. Uh, and he, he, now he was right. He, he went to, I saw all this happen right in front of me. But he, he went to, there was a spot there and the lady backs out. So he's going to pull in. And so he backs, pulls forward and kind of turns a little in, in preparation to back in. Well, as he's backing up, this car goes whoop right into that spot. And man, he blows a gasket. I'm serious. This guy, boy, and even his wife jumps out. And they go back there. And then he come, I don't know what he said, but he came back and that car got out of there. <laughs> and he's so mad still. And so Stephanie is waiting in this place. There's not much, the parking is really weird over there at Mission Barbecue. But Stephanie's waiting kind of, sort of towards the middle of the road because she's going to try to make the turn. Well, he's kind of pulled this way. It's a weird situation. So that he can back in. So then he says... You tell her to get out of the way and I can't get by there. And I said, you're not getting by, sir. You're backing in there, aren't you? And he said, oh, oh, they moved. He said, I'm glad I didn't have my gun. I'd have shot him. And he was dead serious. It was in his face. That's all he could have done. I mean, he didn't have, he, he was pretty old and real long beard and he just didn't look like he could do much. But he was just mad. Just mad or no more. So I just chuckled at him, you know, and told Stephanie not to worry about it, stay right where she was, he'll be all right. And he was. You don't have to go another Christmas without true joy and peace. You don't have to ignore Christ this year. But folks don't show any interest in the Savior. Because they don't understand their need to be saved, as I said earlier. They don't understand the wages of sin is death. That's in the Word of God. Well, that's your Word. No, it's not my Word. It's the Word of God. Amen. What do you want me to say? Everything's, everybody's good. Everybody gets to go to heaven. Everybody can do what they want to do and behave how they want to, as long as you don't commit any huge sins, so to speak. Well, who says what sins are? Everything's on the table. You get to decide yourself what you decide to believe. Well, yeah, you do. But you've got to stand. You've got to stand on something. 
And so I stand on the word of God. Sin plummets people into eternal hell. That's what our God says. If we're going to sit here today and worship God and claim to be Christians, then we better believe the Word of God. Amen. People ignore the remedy. The baby. Y'all, baby Jesus. They ignore that they have this disease. And so what happens? They miss Christmas. They don't miss the present. They, they love that. They get all that. King Herod missed Christmas because he was more interested in killing the baby Messiah than and to protect his own throne. And so the leaders, the theologians missed Christmas. Herod called the exploits, exploits together. And he, the theologians, the chief priests, the captain of the temple police, the, the best of all the teachers and the, with the great speaking skills and the pastors and the elders and the seminary trained professors with their PhDs and the doctorates of ministry. And they all knew the scriptures. They all knew them. They, they grew up with them. They're steeped in them. And you know what they said? Oh, yeah. Yeah. King, we've heard where the Messiah is to be born. He's like, really? Because he was just an old pagan. He didn't know. And they said, yeah. Yeah. Micah 5 2 says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephrathah, because there were two Bethlehem. Oh! They knew. They knew where the Messiah was to be born. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't. God made it very clear in the scripture. What should astonish you more is this, is what they didn't do. They didn't go there. They didn't go. They didn't go to Bethlehem. Now, since the time of Moses, they were taught where the Messiah would be. They longed for him. They hoped for him. They prayed for him. And the ones who knew, the ones who were the intellectuals, the believers, the leaders, the religious teachers, they never bothered to walk two or three miles outside the gates south to Bethlehem to check it out for themselves. And Jesus was in that city for about two years before he left. They still never went that we know of. You and I would probably say, well, I'd do that. I sure would. Boy, I'd walk over there and see the baby Jesus or the, the toddler Jesus. But would you? They know more than, of the Old Testament than we can probably ever hope to know. And yet they missed Christmas. The spiritual leaders at the time of Jesus Christ missed Christmas. And the fact is, out of the entire population of Jerusalem and Judea, only a few shepherds came to see the Messiah. And do you remember what they did? After encouraging him, they joyfully told every, after encountering him, excuse me, they joyfully left and told everybody about that experience. So I would think more people began to come. Maybe, maybe not, because the scriptures don't tell us that. But even then, there is no record that anyone, there's no record, anyone else showed up. Does that mean it didn't happen? Well, it doesn't say it did. Can we assume it did? I don't be careful about assuming. So, you know, he probably lived in Bethlehem, as I said, for a couple of years. They had their opportunities. How many years have we missed Christmas? Really? So we have to be honest with ourselves. Listen, I don't know how many Christmases I missed when I was drinking and carousing. Because to me, Christmas was another time to go to parties. I mean, that's, that's what it was. It's giving gifts and your family around. But as soon as we ate Christmas dinner or got our presents unwrapped as I got older, I was out of there. I went dancing. I went carousing, chasing, skirt chasing, boat scooting, drinking beer, drinking whiskey. Christmas Eve, you bet. Christmas Day, if there was a place open, I'd be there. That was me. So I missed all those Christmases, y'all. Did I acknowledge Jesus? Yeah. I, I, I would walk down the aisle of the Baptist church. I'm saved. All of us are spiritual leaders, by the way, in some respect. Maybe some people at work or in your home are Christians. If so, you are a spiritual leader. If you're a father or a husband, you're definitely a spiritual leader because you're called by God to be the spiritual leader in your home. Both to your wife and to your children. And guys, if you're not being that, you're out of the will of God. 
Mothers are also called to be spiritual leaders, by the way, to their children, to other women, to neighbors, to the people they interact with on a daily basis. Even children can be spiritual leaders to their friends who don't know Christ. We are all called to be spiritual leaders in some way. And so this group of people who miss Christmas hits us right where we are. And we can miss Christmas just as they did. Why did they miss Christmas? I'll tell you why. One word. Indifference. Indifference. They didn't care. Of all three people who missed Christmas, this group is the worst. Having a Messiah was really no big deal to them. At least the innkeeper didn't know because he was too busy. At least Herod, not making excuses, but at least Herod feared Jesus. But the religious leader didn't care. Why not? They were already self-righteous. They were already perfect. They were proud. They were wrapped up in their own pride and their indifference in their own religious system. And there was no room for the Son of God in their lives. And they thought they had all they ever needed. They had all their bases covered. They were God's chosen and that was enough. Who cares about developing an actual relationship with the Messiah? And besides, God's servant wouldn't be caught dead in a stable with a woman who gave birth out of wedlock. Let the government take care of them. Well, maybe most of God's servants wouldn't be caught dead, but the greatest servant, God's own son, King of Kings, was born there. In fact, what happened when Jesus did show up later as a man? They ridiculed him. We know. They hated him. They spit on him. They plotted his murder and eventually killed him. They didn't want him. They didn't need him. The ultimate crime against Christ is indifference. They were just not interested. Will Christmas come? Today, many people miss Christmas because they don't realize it. They don't realize their need. They may have eternal life if they believed in Jesus for everlasting life. They may be going to heaven. They most likely go to church. They observe religious traditions. But what? That, that, that's where it stops for many. For some here probably. They think they know what they need to know about Christ and who He is and what He did and he, what He did, and they don't really have that relationship with Him that He wants to develop. They don't really want Him in their daily lives, and they don't really want to follow Him. They don't really want to serve the poor and the homeless, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. They don't really want to show mercy, love, grace, forgiveness to the outcast, the rejected, the abused make friends with the tax collectors and the sinners of the, our day. Oh no, that's too radical, that's too dangerous. What would our good Christian friends say if we befriended a Muslim or a drug addict? Woo! So, throughout this Christmas, the bells of churches are going to ring all over the world. Great cathedrals will host Christmas church uh, uh, celebrations and Many are going to travel. But how many will be just like the priests and scribes of Matthew who wouldn't travel two miles to see Jesus? They possess all the knowledge, but it really makes no difference in their lives. Knowledge puffs up. It's just another holiday. No joy, no peace. Today, let's be sure. Let's be sure that we savor every bit of joy and meaning in Christmas. The innkeeper, King Herod, the religious leader, missed out. But we can keep the blessing of Christmas by eliminating the hurried moments, by focusing on others and their needs, and remembering to keep Jesus at the center of our planning and celebrating that activity. Why do we have to keep remembering that? Because the world wants us to be busy. That's why. Well, I should, you shouldn't have to remember that. We should already know. Well, of course. But we live in a fallen world. And if you do these things, you're going to emerge in this new coming year and through Christmas with a Christ-centered joy. With Christmas in your heart. Activity is synonymous with Christmas. Hanging with relatives, the decorations, the feasts, the lights. So to speak, we focus on the knowledge sometimes of Christmas. When we humble ourselves and seek to serve Him, you will experience Christmas in your heart. Are you ready for Christ? Are you ready for Christ's Mass? Christmas. 
Are you ready for it to come into your heart right now, Christmas? For those of us who have accepted Christ into our hearts, He's born in us and we are born again through His Spirit. Here's something that might also help for Christmas to come for us this year. I wonder if it simply takes recalling the wonder we experienced when we first met Christ. Maybe we've forgotten the smells and the elements or even the place where we knelt in our filth, our sin, and our misery and humbly asked for forgiveness and worshipped and adored Him. That first sense of awe and peace and grace and love. Do you remember that? Do you remember it all? Have you forgotten it? Remember that. Remember what that was like stepping out of that darkness and into the light of Christ. And then keep that gift close to your heart so that every Christmas comes and it will. Will Christmas come? Yes. How it comes is up to you. Amen? Amen. What do you stand for? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we gather here and humbly come to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the praise that we're able to offer, and thank you, Lord, for the word that we're able to share together. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we would examine our hearts, and that this really would be a Christmas as it should be as it was meant to be. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and lives. Keep us on point, Lord Jesus. Forgive us where we fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Bible says, lift up your voice in a shout of triumph. Jesus Christ is triumphant. You are more than conqueror because of him who loves us. So we're going to say hallelujah as we always do on three. You ready? You ready? Okay. One, two, three. Hallelujah! God bless you, church. Have an awesome week.